Hi, I'm Toby Alavi, and I almost died playing a game that I love. This is my story. What's your name? Toby Alavi. How old are you? I'm 20 years of age. Where are you from? I'm originally from Elephant and Castle. Um, we moved, me and my family, to Bexley when I was younger with my brother and my sister and my mum and my dad. Uh, growing up in Elephant and Castle, I was very young, so I don't remember much, but what I do remember, it was very vibrant. Um, it was a multicultural community, um, and we lived in a sort of like a a, a block, but it was like a cul-de-sac, one way in, one way out. Um, everybody knew everybody. Everybody was friendly with everybody. Um, but it was quite rough at the same time. I remember there was a shop that we always used to go to, me and my brother and my sister. Um, and my mum would always tell my sister, hold the note tight in your hand so that um, no one takes it from you. Um, that's, that's sort of a, a memory that sticks in my mind. Um, and I remember playing in the park as well. That was in the centre of the block. Um, and I vividly remember our house, our apartment, if you want to call it that. Football came into my life um, when I was, I'd say, five years old. That's when I first went to Crayford Arrows. Um, looking back, going from Crayford Arrows to West Ham at that age now, um, when I remember what it was like, I sort of think, how could those boys be that good at that age? You know what I mean? Um, it was a big jump, a really big jump, and there was a golfing class between us and them. Um, so it was a bit difficult, it was a bit daunting. Um, but at the same time, I think it helped because it sort of helped me to, it eased, the pro it eased the process of me signing for Millwall because I already knew what that environment was sort of like. Um, Millwall offered me something when I was playing at a tournament in Tunbridge Wells um, and I scored like 15 goals or something like that um, and we got to the final and I scored a hat-trick but it was 3-3 and then it went to penalties and we won on penalties and then I remember this big guy um, called Steve Birchwell just walked over to me and I'll never forget this, he was like, you alright son? He was like, where's your dad? And I was like, <laughs> um, and then we went over to my dad. Um, they said whatever. Um, he gave my dad his card and he, he said he'll be in touch. And from there, that's when um, I sort of cemented my place in Millwall Football Club. Um, my timeline from Millwall from an eight year old to being a scholar and in the first team set up. Um, Obviously, from the schoolboy age up until about 15, when I said I um, realised what it was to be a professional footballer, um, it was it was just calm, really. Um, you just enjoyed yourself, just enjoyed football. There was no pressure, no nothing. Um, and then when I started to take it more seriously, I sort of put that pressure on myself to be better and do better. Um, and then from that point onwards, it became more um, serious. I mean, you get on the pitch, you're here to do business. You're here to be better than the guy you're playing against. You're here to dominate him, either if it's with your mind or um, beat him with a trick or outpace him, you know what I mean? Um, so it, it sort of became like every time I stepped on the pitch, I was doing battle with whoever I'm playing against. So you put that pressure on yourself? Yeah, I put that sort of pressure on myself. If we go back to when I was... 14. Um, it was an evening training session at Eltham Green, uh, and we were just playing normally. Um, and then we had a drinks break, um, and I just felt a bit dizzy and a bit out of breath, if you like. Um, and I just collapsed then, uh, and I was told I had a seizure on the floor. Uh, the coaches told me to go inside 
Um, one of the boys' moms was a paramedic. Um, and she said that she thinks I, I could be dehydrated. Um, so that's what we attributed it to, just dehydration. Um, and the same thing happened again. I'd say two or three months later, I was playing a basketball game uh, in school. And I just got dizzy and I just fell backwards and I hit my head on the door. Um, and again, I just thought, okay, maybe I need to drink more water because I was told by a paramedic that I may be dehydrated. Uh, so at that point, I didn't really take it too seriously. I just thought, okay, I just need to drink more water sort of thing. Do you wish that you were advised better? I do. And I wish that more, uh, more care was taken. I wish it was looked into more because dehydrated or not, it's not normal for somebody to be collapsing at training. Uh, but of course, at that time, awareness wasn't really as high as it is now. It's still not enough now, but it wasn't really at this sort of level back then for anybody to sort of think it could be something more serious. Um, so in that respect, I sort of understand. Don't agree, but understand why nothing was done. If someone said to me that when I was at Hampton and Richmond, I'd be retiring at that level, in a few years' time, I would have said there's something wrong with you. Um, unthinkable. Unthinkable, firstly, to be at that level in a few years' time. No disrespect to anybody that's at, that's at that level. Um, and unthinkable to think I'd be retiring in a few years' time. Um, I would have laughed in their face, to be honest. Before I terminate my contract, I was due for a heart screening because um, I collapsed in Sweden twice. Um, first day I got there, I collapsed, uh, and they referred me to the doctors, and I had tests for asthma, and they said I had asthma. Um, then I collapsed again about a month or two later, uh, and then I was referred for heart checkups, um, and obviously they didn't suffice due to the fact that I left. My time at Met Police started well. Uh, I scored two goals on my debut, and I got an assist. Uh, then scored a couple more goals. To be fair, it was quite a, a, a successful campaign as, as long as it lasted. I think I got about seven and 13. Um, so I, I enjoyed my time there as well. Um, it's just a shame that it was cut short prematurely. Um, there was a game against Cray Wanderers, uh, which is when I all, which is when I started feeling funny uh, after the game. Uh, in the warm up, I got really dizzy uh, and I couldn't really breathe properly. And I was actually walking around in circles, um, really, really trying to compose myself and keep myself calm. Uh, I knew what was happening because obviously in Sweden it got a bit more serious. Um, so I sort of knew what was coming, uh, so I just really tried to fight it and control it, uh, which I did successfully. Um, and I just told one of the coaches, look, I feel a bit funny. Um, my asthma's playing up, because obviously at the time I still thought I had asthma. Um, just keep an eye on me, sort of thing. Uh, and I played the game, and I was okay throughout the game, thankfully. Um, and it was just uh, that weekend, after that weekend, that's when I started to feel really funny. Uh, I can't really put a finger in it, but I remember saying to my girlfriend, I said, um, in the car, that I'm, I don't feel right, there's something wrong with me. And she was sort of saying, what's, what's the matter? And I just said, I don't know. I said, there's just something not right with me. I just felt really distant from everything and everyone. Um, not distant in terms of not being sociable, distant in terms of I could be sitting next to you and talking to you, but my mind's in a faraway place sort of thing. Um, and that's how I started to feel. Uh, and then on the Sunday, I ran up the stairs and I sort of felt the same thing again that I felt in the um, Cray game. Um, and on the Monday after the Sunday, I just thought, you know, I need to go to the doctors and get checked out because this isn't right. Uh, so I called in and booked uh, a chest X-ray and a heart ECG and an echo scan um, and a blood test for the Wednesday. Um, but obviously I, I, 
had the game on the Tuesday before the Wednesday. Uh, so I didn't end up having the test. Well, I didn't need the test because I was in hospital. Um, I just didn't feel myself, you know. Uh, and I remember in the car on the way to the game, I told my manager that I've got these chest x-rays and heart scans booked and whatever. Um, and he was sort of saying, are you sure you're right to play sort of thing? And I said, yeah, I'll be fine. Um, that's silly me just wanting to play football, you know what I mean? Uh, but I knew there was something not right, but I still couldn't put my finger on it. Um, and in the warm-up, we were warming up and I just, it was, it's just so strange. I just didn't feel like I was going to play football. And I, I knew in my mind I wasn't going to play a whole game. Um, I didn't warm up properly. I was sort of walking around and just jogging around and whatnot. Um, and I was having a joke about with one of, or two of the boys. Um, and then I felt the, the symptoms again. Uh, and one of the boys said to me, like, Tobe, it's a friendly common. If you don't feel right, don't play. Um, again, silly me. If I want to play football, if I'm going to play a match, I'm going to play a match, you know what I mean? No one can tell me not to play the match. Uh, And yeah, and so in the warm up, I didn't really feel right. Uh, and I still continued to play. And the game came around. Yeah. 25 minutes into the game, I mean, <laughs> those few seconds before, what had actually happened <coughs> prior, to, prior to that happening? Prior to my incident happening, uh, I actually felt really out of breath, uh, but it wasn't symptomatic. It wasn't like what I feel when I'm starting to feel a certain way. Um, I just felt like I was unfit, if you like, which wasn't the case. Um, and I was actually going to signal to come off because I just didn't feel right at all. Uh, and it was after a through ball that I went for. Uh, and I was jogging back slowly, uh, and then I sort of start to get short of breath uh, and really dizzy. So I sort of slowed to a walk, and then I just couldn't breathe at all. Uh, so I was caught, and everything happened so slowly. It was like it was in slow motion. And then I called, uh, well, I tried to call my teammate and tell him that there's something wrong, get this guy to get me off, or come over or, you know what I mean, look at me or something, and I just couldn't. Uh, and next thing I know, I was just on the floor with loads of people around me, uh, and I couldn't breathe. And for the first time after that sort of thing happened, I couldn't breathe. Um, and I remember there was a doctor, and he put me on my side, and I was just checking my pulse. Uh, and I just remember talking and sort of, him just his hand here on my on my wrist um, saying yeah his pulse is getting stronger and whatnot. And then thereafter, where did you go? Um, after about ten minutes on the floor, I was escorted off the pitch um, into the showers to get showered up and to take into the stands, and I felt really bad. For the first time again after that sort of episode, I felt horrible. I felt really groggy, I had a bad headache, I felt dizzy, my chest was hurting. Um, so after the game, I was taken to the hospital um, and they did tests on me there. Uh, they did a blood test and an ECG, and both of the tests that I did were worrying to them. Um, my ECG was abnormal, and my blood test came back with high levels of troponium, um, which is common when people have heart attacks. Um, the normal level is 100, mine was 250. Uh, so they were sort of thinking I'd had a heart attack, a mild heart attack. Um, uh, they kept me in for a few more days, uh, did some tests on me, uh, which is when they sort of started to run with the theme of HCM, which is what they thought I could potentially have. Um, and it was at that point they sort of told me that I'm being transferred to St Thomas's to do more testing because they got a cardiac unit there. Uh, and that's when 
the sort of seriousness of everything was sort of dawning on me. Um, I wasn't really thinking anything. My head was, it's like my head was clear. Uh, I was sort of emotionless because I wasn't really sure what was going on, but I, I didn't think I would be able to play football again, that's for sure. Um, I think it was the second test I did in St Thomas's on the treadmill the week after the collapse against Mosley. Uh, and I was on the treadmill and doing a stress test and then um, a stress test is where they connect ECG leads to your body. You have a um, blood pressure um, band across your arm um, and sort of something around your waist and it just monitors everything. You start off walking and the speed and incline increases every three minutes. Um, so I was doing that and I think I got to about the 23rd minute. Uh, and then I started to feel a bit funny again. So I just told them that I need to stop the test. Um, and then they stopped it or slowed it to a walk. And then uh, it's like the more, the more I walked, the more out of breath I got. And again, this all happened in slow motion. Um, I couldn't breathe and I couldn't really take in what was going on around me. Um, and again, I felt like I was trying to tell them to open a window or open a door, take me outside because I needed to breathe and I just couldn't get any words out. Um, and then they stopped the treadmill and I was getting off and I just couldn't, I couldn't really move. And I just told the woman to take the thing off me, um, the sort of a pouch for the ECG leads. Uh, and as I was stepping off, I guess I blacked out because that's the last thing I remember, stepping off the treadmill. Um, yeah, I just remember stepping off and waking up on the floor with loads of noise and doctors and people around me and I was sweating so much. Like they, they said I was unconscious for about 10 minutes, um, 10 seconds, sorry. Um, I was just sweating a ridiculous amount. Um, and when I, was, when I was out on the floor, again, this is all happening. This feels like an eternity is going past. Um, I was, it was just pitch black and then got really, really bright. And then um, it was like I was dreaming. And then there was a church that we used to go to when we were really young and um, there was a park next to it and it was like I was in myself looking at myself, my brother, my sister and some other kids playing in the park. Uh, and then it was just really weird. I didn't really understand what was going on and then it just got brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And then I heard someone saying, Toby, 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 Toby. Um, and then while that was happening, I felt like I was shaking. You know what I mean, like rocking back and forth. Obviously, I'm lying down and I thought I was moving like this, like vigorously shaking, like I was trying to get up or something like that. Uh, and then the, 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 la the lady was saying my name, Toby, Toby, and then I sort of came back around. Um, and then, I was, like I said, I was sweating unbelievable amounts. Um, the doctor was next to me, there was noise, the alarm was going off, um, doctors were just talking, running all over the place and again I couldn't breathe like against Mosley. Um, and then I was trying to tell him to move back and again I couldn't speak. Um, and eventually they sat me upright, still sweating, the lady that was calling me was behind me, drying me, drying the sweat off me. Um, and it wasn't really working because I just kept sweating and sweating and sweating. Um, and um, they, a couple of minutes later, they, they gave me a cup of water and I was trying to hold it. 
and I couldn't really hold it. Like my hands were shaking, and it was just I tried to lift it to drink, and I couldn't lift it to drink at all. Um, and then the lady obviously gave it to me, <laughs> and a few minutes later, I'd say about five minutes later, um, I was lifted up onto the seat where I sat down, um, and I sort of sort of recuperating. Uh, and then the three, three of the doctors walked over to the screen and they were talking. And then they, they were sort of murmuring, murmuring, and in like a worried tone. And um, I said, what's going on, sort of thing. Um, but at this point, I was still disorientated. I, I just didn't really hear anything they said to me, if they said anything at all. Um, and then when I fully came around, the two doctors had left. Um, and I said to him, like, what was all that about, sort of thing? And then he said that, um, we've looked on the screen and your heart um, paused for, no, he said there's a, there's a, there was a pause in your heartbeat for five seconds. Um, and he said it so calmly, like it was a normal thing. And I was just thinking, hold, like, um, what do you mean? Um, and then I said to him, I said, what do you mean? My heart paused for five seconds, do you mean it stopped beating? And he said, yeah. Um, and then it was at that point where it sort of dawned on me that that was sort of it. Like I wouldn't play again. Uh, obviously I hadn't been told, but it sort of dawned on me then. And I just broke down in tears and started crying. Uh, and then he uh, left the room, just asked me if I wanted to be alone for a while, and he just left the room. Uh, well, stood by the door, obviously, because they can't leave you alone, but, yeah. And it was from that moment on that, unofficially, I knew that that was it. Without being told, I knew that was it. <laughs> I, I was inconsolable. I, I couldn't, I just, well, I was just thinking, like, why me? Like, what did I do wrong sort of thing, you know what I mean? Like all the years of training, working hard, getting to training early to do bits, leaving training late, doing extras with my brother, my dad taking me all over the country, it just, I just didn't understand uh, why it was happening to me. Um, those were the sort of questions that were going through my mind. and. I remember thinking when I got taken up to a ward, like, am I, is this real? Like, am I dreaming? Or, you know what I mean? Because I just couldn't believe it. And I'd say for about two or three days, I just, I refused visitors. I didn't want to see anyone. Uh, the only people I saw were my family, and I just about saw them. I didn't even want to see them. Just wanted to be left alone, sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's that's how it felt to me at the time. Uh, At what point did you accept it? <laughs> I don't know if I have accepted it. Time will tell if I've accepted it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I've got on with life. Whether or not I've accepted it, I'm still yet to find out. Um, there were guys in there a lot of older guys because I was in a cardiac unit um, who were having heart bypasses and heart transplants and lung and heart transplants um, and they were there just encouraging me because they knew what was going on with me they were trying to uplift me um, and after about the fourth day I was just thinking if these guys going through all this can sort of try and encourage me in their pain in their struggle um, then who am I to sort of shut everyone off and continue being depressed like there's there's two ways you can you can deal with these sorts of things you can be depressed shut yourself off from the world feel sorry for yourself or you can sort of use what has happened to you to make a difference either with people in the profession you've been in or in your own life like use it as motivation to do something else um, and I sort of chose the the latter I think this 
I think what gave me the strength to sort of look at things in this perspective is the fact that I'm still alive and here today um, because it didn't register to me the serious of what was happening to me until some doctors, they just couldn't explain how I'd had ser a series of collapses and still been able to just get up and walk on like nothing has happened. Um, especially with the most recent one in, in hospital. Um, I was told that I'm lucky to be alive. And if you're lucky to be alive, you don't sit down and waste the life that you're blessed to have. You know what I mean? Um, and I've always been a very determined person and a very motivated person, so I think those sort of traits that I have have sort of helped me to pick myself up. What I'm doing now, what I'm embarking upon now is not for any sort of personal gain. Um, I just think it's something, especially because it's happened to me, it's something that is largely overlooked in the game. Um, and it's also something that can easily be dealt with if the right people want to deal with it. Um, I know a, a lady, um, Mrs. Uh, Lamin, uh, Auntie Lamin, I call her, she lost her son um, on the 5th of February this year. Uh, he was 16 years of age, I was on the verge of being signed for Fulham um, to do a scholarship this year. Uh, and he just collapsed while playing with his friends. He had a cardiac arrest. Um, and that, that was local to me, so that sort of hit home as well. Um, because you sort of feel her pain, you know what I mean? Like she's an amazing, she's a strong woman, but you can, you can feel her pain, and that, that sort of pain shouldn't be felt by a mother um, if something can be done to prevent it. Um, my family are lucky that they didn't have to feel that sort of pain, and I wouldn't wish that upon anybody, and I wouldn't wish what I've had to go through upon anybody because it's, it's, it's not good at all, and it can be um, prevented. Like I said, if the right people want to prevent it, they can prevent it, which is why I'm sort of working in conjunction with um, the right people to sort of push it to the places it needs to be. And we won't stop until we're heard and something's done. And what do you want to be done? It's quite simple. It's not an outrageous request. This the sort of heart conditions and fatalities that we're talking about can mutate and develop with time. Um, I said I had a test at Millwall at, at 16 years of age and it wasn't in depth, which it wasn't. But at the same time, maybe I didn't have anything at that point in time. Um, and then if I was checked again at 17, maybe I still wouldn't have had anything. But if I was checked again at 18, maybe they would have seen something that would have raised a few alarm bells and could have sort of triggered them to say, OK, we sort of need to assess where we're at with regards to you playing football. Um, as devastating as that can be, um, to tell somebody it's better than losing your life. Um, so my stance is that from the age of 14 up until your veteran at the club, they should be getting yearly screenings. Reason being because <laughs> things can mutate a 15-year-old, a 14-year-old could have something um, at 14 and be told, look, you can't continue playing football. He still has X amount of years to make life changes, um, to pursue a different career path. It's better than a 20-year-old being told you can't play football anymore when you spent that amount of time pursuing that dream. Um, and between that gap of 14 and 20, you make a lot of life choices that affect your future with regards to studies and work and if the younger you find out the better it is if you do have anything.